Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. King Lear. The depiction of the Heath of popular and critical fallacy of interpretation, King Lear is a tragedy written by William Shakespeare. It depicts the gradual descent into madness of the title character, after he disposes of his kingdom giving bequests to two of his three daughters based on their flattery of him, bringing tragic consequences for all. Derived from the legend of Lair of Britain, a mythological pre-Roman Celtic king, the play has been widely adapted for the stage and motion pictures, with the title role coveted by many of the world's most accomplished actors. The first attribution to Shakespeare of this play, originally drafted in 1605 or 1606 at the latest, with its first known performance on St. Stephen's Day in 1606, was a 1608 publication in a quarto of uncertain provenance, in which the play is listed as a history, it may be an early draft, or simply reflect the first performance text, The Tragedy of King Lear. A more theatrical revision, was included in the 1623 first folio. Modern editors usually conflate the two, though some insist that each version has its own individual integrity that should be preserved. After the English Restoration, the play was often revised with a happy, non-tragic ending for audiences who disliked its dark and depressing tone, but since the 19th century Shakespeare's original version has been regarded as one of his supreme achievements. The tragedy is particularly noted for its probing observations on the nature of human suffering and kinship. George Bernard Shaw wrote, No man will ever write a better tragedy than Lear. Characters Leah, King of Britain Goneril, Leah's eldest daughter Regan, Leah's second daughter Cordelia, Leah's youngest daughter Duke of Albany, Goneril's husband Duke of Cornwall, Regan's husband Earl of Gloucester Earl of Kent, later disguised as Keyes Edgar, Gloucester's son Edmund, Gloucester's illegitimate son Oswald, Goneril's steward Fool, Leah's full King of France, Suter and later husband to Cordelia Duke of Burgundy, Suter, to Cordelia Curran, courtier old man, tenant of Gloucester officer, employed by Edmund Gentleman, attends Cordelia servants to Cornwall Knights of Lear's train officers, messengers, soldiers, and attendants. Act 1 King Lear of Britain, elderly and wanting to retire from the duties of the monarchy, decides to divide his realm among his three daughters, and declares he will offer the largest share to the one who loves him most. The eldest Goneril speaks first, declaring her love for her father in fulsome terms. Moved by her flattery, Lear proceeds to grant to Goneril her share as soon as she has finished her declaration, before Regan and Cordelia have a chance to speak. He then awards to Regan her share as soon as she has spoken. When it is finally the turn of his youngest and favorite daughter, Cordelia, at first she refuses to say anything and then declares there is nothing to compare her love to, nor words. To properly express it, she speaks honestly, but bluntly, which infuriates him. In his anger, he disinherits Cordelia and divides her share between Regan and Goneril. The Earl of Gloucester and the Earl of Kent observe that, by dividing his realm between Goneril and Regan, Lear has awarded his realm in equal shares to the peerages of the Duke of Albany and the Duke of Cornwall. Kent objects to Lear's unfair treatment of Cordelia. Enraged by Kent's protests, Lear banishes him from the country. Lear then summons the Duke of Burgundy and the King of France, who have both proposed marriage to Cordelia. Learning that Cordelia has been disinherited, the Duke of Burgundy withdraws his suit. But the King of France is impressed by her honesty and marries her nonetheless. 
the King of France is shocked by Lear's decision, because up until this time Lear has only praised and favoured Cordelia. Meanwhile, Gloucester has introduced his illegitimate son Edmund to Kent. Lear announces he will live alternately with Goneril and Regan, and their husbands. He reserves to himself a retinue of 100 knights, to be supported by his daughters. Goneril and Regan speak privately, revealing that their declarations of love were fake, and that they view Lear as a foolish old man. Edmund resents his illegitimate status, and plots to dispose of his legitimate older brother Edgar. He tricks their father Gloucester with a forged letter, making him think Edgar plans to usurp the estate. Kent returns from exile in disguise, and Lear hires him as a servant. At Albany and Gonroll's house, Lear and Kent quarrel with Oswald, Gonroll's steward. Lear discovers that now that Goneril has power, she no longer respects him. She orders him to reduce the number of his disorderly retinue. Enraged, Lear departs for Regan's home. The fool mocks Lear's misfortune. Act 2 Edmund learns from Curran, a courtier, that there is likely to be war between Albany and Cornwall and that Regan and Cornwall are to arrive at Gloucester's house that evening. Taking advantage of the arrival of the Duke and Regan, Edmund fakes an attack by Edgar, and Gloucester is completely taken in. He disinherits Edgar and proclaims him an outlaw. Bearing Lear's message to Regan, Kent meets Oswald again at Gloucester's home, quarrels with him again, and is put in the stocks by Regan and her husband Cornwall. When Lear arrives, he objects to the mistreatment of his messenger, but Regan is as dismissive of her father as Goneril was. Lear is enraged but impotent. Goneril arrives and supports Regan's argument against him. Lear yields completely to his rage. He rushes out into a storm to rant against his ungrateful daughters, accompanied by the mocking fool. Kent later follows to protect him. Gloucester protests against Lear's mistreatment, with Lear's retinue of a hundred knights dissolved. The only companions he has left are his fool and Kent, wandering on the heath after the storm. Edgar, in the guise of a madman named Tom of Bedlam, meets Lear. Edgar babbles madly while Lear denounces his daughters. Kent leads them all to shelter. Act 3 Edmund betrays Gloucester to Cornwall, Regan and Goneril. He reveals evidence that his father knows of an impending French invasion designed to reinstate Lear to the throne, and in fact a French army has landed in Britain. Once Edmund leaves with Goneril to warn Albany about the invasion, Gloucester is arrested, and Regan and Cornwall gouge out Gloucester's eyes. As he is doing so, a servant is overcome with rage by what he is witnessing and attacks Cornwall, mortally wounding him. Regan kills the servant, and tells Gloucester that Edmund betrayed him, then she turns him out to wander the heath too. Edgar, in his madman's guise, meets his blinded father on the heath. Gloucester, not recognizing him, begs Tom to lead him to a cliff at Dover so that he may jump to his death. Sources S. Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Printed in 1577, Shakespeare's play is based on various accounts of the semi legendary Brythonic Figalaire of Britain, whose name has been linked by some scholars to the Brythonic god Lear, LLYR, though in actuality the names are not etymologically related. Shakespeare's most important source is probably the second edition of the Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland by Raphael Hollinshead, published in 1587. Hollinshead himself found the story in the earlier Historia Regum Britanniae, by Geoffrey of Monmouth, which was written in the 12th century. 
Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, published 1590, also contains a character named Cordelia, who also dies from hanging, as in King Lear. Other possible sources are the anonymous play King Lear, The Mirror of the Magistrates, by John Higgins, The Malcontent, by John Marston, The London Prodigal, Montaigne's Essays, which were translated into English by John Florio in 1603, an historical description of Ireland of Britain, by William Harrison, Remains Concerning Britain, by William Camden, Albion's England, by William Warner, and A Declaration of Egregious Popish Impostures, by Samuel Harsnett, which provided some of the language used by Edgar while he feigns madness. King Lear is also a literary variant of a common fairy tale, Love Like Salt, Aunt Thompson Type 923, in which a father rejects his youngest daughter for a statement of her love that does not please him. The source of the subplot involving Gloucester, Edgar, and Edmund is a tale in Philip Sidney's Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia with a blind Paphlagonian king and his two sons, Leonatus and Plexitrus. Changes from source material Besides the subplot involving the Earl of Gloucester and his sons, the principal innovation Shakespeare made to this story was the death of Cordelia and Lear. At the end, in the account by Geoffrey of Monmouth, Cordelia restores Lear to the throne and succeeds him as ruler after his death. During the 17th century, Shakespeare's tragic ending was much criticized and alternative versions were written by Nahum Tate, in which the leading characters survived and Edgar and Cordelia were married. As Harold Bloom states, Tate's version held the stage for almost 150 years until Edmund Keen reinstated the play's tragic ending in 1823. Date and text Edition, published in 1608. Although an exact date of composition cannot be given, many academic editors of the play date King Lear between 1603 and 1606. The latest it could have been written is 1606 as the stationer's register notes a performance on 26 December 1606. The 1603 date originates from words in Edgar's speeches which may derive from Samuel Harsnett's declaration of egregious popish impostures. In his Arden edition, R.A. Folks argues for a date of 1605-6 because one of Shakespeare's sources the true chronicle history of King Lear was not published until 1605. Close correspondences between the play and Shakespeare's suggest that he may have been working from a text. Conversely, Frank Kermode, in The Riverside Shakespeare, considers the publication of Lear to have been a response to performances of Shakespeare's already written play, noting a sonnet by William Strachey that may have verbal resemblances with Lear. Kermode concludes that, 16045 seems the best compromise. Dr. Naseeb Shaheen dates the play C16056 per line 1.2.103, these late eclipses in the sun and moon, which relates to the lunar eclipse of 27 September 1605 and the solar eclipse of 2 October 1605. The modern text of King Lear derives from three sources, two quartos, published in 1608 and 1619 respectively, and the version in the first folio of 1623. The differences between these versions are significant. Q1 contains 285 lines not in F1. F1 contains around 100 lines not in Q1. Also, at least a thousand individual words are changed between the two texts. Each text has a completely different style of punctuation, and about half the verse lines in the F1 are either printed as prose, or differently divided in the Q1. The early editors, beginning with Alexander Pope, 
simply conflated the two texts, creating the modern version that has remained nearly universal. For centuries, the conflated version is born from the hypothesis that Shakespeare wrote only one original manuscript, now unfortunately lost, and that the quarto and folio versions are distortions of that original. Others, such as Nuttall and Bloom, have identified Shakespeare himself as having been involved in reworking passages in the play to accommodate performances and other textual requirements of the play. As early as 1931, Madeleine Doran suggested that the two texts had basically different provenances, and that these differences between them were critically interesting. This argument, however, was not widely discussed until the late 1970s, when it was revived principally by Michael Warren and Gary Taylor. The thesis, while controversial, has gained significant acceptance. It posits, essentially, that the quarto derives from something close to Shakespeare's foul papers, and the folio is drawn in some way from a prompt book, prepared for production by Shakespeare's company as someone else. In short, Q1 is authorial, F1 is theatrical. In criticism, the rise of revision criticism has been part of the pronounced trend away from mid-century formalism. The new Cambridge Shakespeare has published separate editions of Q and F. The most recent Pelican Shakespeare edition contains both the 1608 quarto and the 1623 folio text as well as a conflated version, the new Arden edition edited by R.A. Folks is the only recent edition to offer the traditional conflated text. Both Anthony Nuttall of Oxford University and Harold Bloom of Yale University have endorsed the view of Shakespeare having revised the tragedy at least once during his lifetime. As Bloom indicates, at the close of Shakespeare's revised King Lear, a reluctant Edgar becomes King of Britain, accepting his destiny, but in the accents of despair. Nuttall speculates that Edgar, like Shakespeare himself, usurps the power of manipulating the audience by deceiving poor Gloucester. Historicist Interpretations John F. Danby, in his Shakespeare's Doctrine of Nature, a study of King Lear, argues that Lear dramatizes, among other things, the current meanings of nature. The words nature, natural and unnatural occur over 40 times in the play, reflecting a debate in Shakespeare's time about what nature really was like. This debate pervades the play and finds symbolic expression in Lear's changing attitude to thunder. There are two strongly contrasting views of human nature in the play, that of the Lear party, exemplifying the philosophy of Bacon and Hooker, and that of the Edmund party, akin to the views later formulated by Hobbes, along with the two views of nature. Lear contains two views of reason, brought out in Gloucester and Edmund's speeches on astrology. The rationality of the Edmund party is one with which a modern audience more readily identifies. But the Edmund party carries bold rationalism to such extremes that it becomes madness, a madness in reason. The ironic counterpart of Lear's reason in madness, and the fool's wisdom in folly. This portrayal of reason lies behind the play's later emphasis on feeling the two natures, and the two reasons imply two societies. Edmund is the new man, a member of an age of competition, suspicion, glory, in contrast with the older society which has come down from the Middle Ages, with its belief in cooperation reasonable decency, and respect for the whole as greater than the part. King Lear is thus an allegory. The older society, that of the medieval vision, with its doting king, falls into error, and is threatened by the new Machiavellianism. It is regenerated and saved by a vision of a new order, embodied in the king's rejected daughter, 
Cordelia, in the allegorical scheme, is threefold, a person, an ethical principle, and a community. Nevertheless, Shakespeare's understanding of the new man is so extensive as to amount almost to sympathy. Edmund is the last great expression in Shakespeare of the side of Renaissance individualism, the energy, the emancipation, the courage, which has made a positive contribution to the heritage of the West. He embodies something vital which a final synthesis must reaffirm. But he makes an absolute claim which Shakespeare will not support. It is right for man to feel, as Edmund does, that society exists for man, not man for society. It is not right to assert the kind of man Edmund would erect to this supremacy. The play offers an alternative to the feudal Machiavellian polarity, an alternative foreshadowed in France's speech, in Lear and Gloucester's prayers, and in the figure of Cordelia. Until the decent society is achieved, we are meant to take as role model Edgar, the Machiavel of goodness, endurance, courage, and rightness. Psychoanalytic and Psychosocial Interpretations King Lear provides a basis for the primary enactment of psychic breakdown in English literary history. The play begins with Lear's near fairy tale narcissism. Given the absence of legitimate mothers in King Lear, Coppelia Khan provides a psychoanalytic interpretation of the maternal subtext found in the play. According to Khan, Lear's old age forces him to regress into an infantile disposition, and he now seeks a love that is traditionally satisfied by a mothering woman. But in the absence of a real mother, his daughters become the mother figures. Lear's contest of love between Goneril, Regan, and Cordelia serves as the binding agreement. His daughters will get their inheritance provided that they care for him, especially Cordelia, on whose kind nursery he will greatly depend. Cordelia's refusal to dedicate herself to him and love him as more than a father is often interpreted as a resistance to incest. But Khan also inserts the image of a rejecting mother. The situation is now a reversal of parent-child roles in which Lear's madness is a childlike rage due to his deprivation of maternal care. Even when Lear and Cordelia are captured together, his madness persists as Lear envisions a nursery in prison, where Cordelia's sole existence is for him. It is only with Cordelia's death that his fantasy of a daughter-mother ultimately diminishes. As King Lear concludes with only male characters living, Circa 1779, Sigmund Freud asserted that Cordelia symbolizes death. Therefore, when the play begins with Lear rejecting his daughter, it can be interpreted as him rejecting death. Lear is unwilling to face the finitude of his being. The play's poignant ending scene, wherein Lear carries the body of his beloved Cordelia, was of great importance to Freud. In this scene, Cordelia forces the realization of his finitude, or as Freud put it, she causes him to make friends with the necessity of dying. It is logical to infer that Shakespeare had particular intentions with Cordelia's death, as he was the only writer to have Cordelia killed. Alternatively, an analysis based on Adlerian theory suggests that the king's contest among his daughters in Act I has more to do with his control over the unmarried Cordelia. This theory indicates that the king's dethronement might have led him to seek control that he lost after he divided his land. In his study of the character portrayal of Edmund, Harold Bloom refers to him as Shakespeare's most original character. As Hazlitt pointed out, writes Bloom, Edmund does not share in the hypocrisy of Goneril and Regan, his Machiavellianism is absolutely pure, and lacks an Oedipal motive. Freud's vision of family romances simply does not apply to Edmund. Iago is free 
to reinvent himself every minute, yet Iago has strong passions, however negative. Edmund has no passions whatsoever, he has never loved anyone, and he never will. In that respect, he is Shakespeare's most original character. The tragedy of Lear's lack of understanding of the consequences of his demands and actions is often observed to be like that of a spoiled child. But it has also been noted that his behavior is equally likely to be seen in parents who have never adjusted to their children having grown up. Christianity Critics are divided on the question of whether or not King Lear represents an affirmation of a particular Christian doctrine. Among those who argue that Lear is redeemed in the Christian sense through suffering are A.C. Bradley and John Rhea Bettens, who has written, through his sufferings, Lear has won an enlightened soul. Other critics who find no evidence of redemption and emphasize the horrors of the final act include John Holloway and Marvin Rosenberg. William R. Elton stresses the pre-Christian setting of the play, writing that, Lear fulfills the criteria for pagan behavior in life, falling into total blasphemy at the moment of his irredeemable loss. Fairy Tales In the first edition of Kinder und Hausmarchen by the Brothers Grimm, the Anhang entry, to number 71 Princess Mouskin included a note, as the father here. So asks King Lear his daughter. The English translation of this story by Oliver Liu begins as follows. A king had three daughters, their aunt he wanted to know, which loved him most, let them come in front of him and ask them. The eldest spoke. She loved him more than the whole kingdom, the second, more than all the precious stones and pearls in the world, but the third said, she loved him more than salt. The king was so upset, that she compared her love of him with such a small thing, gave her to a servant and commanded, he should take her into the forest and kill her. Performance History King Lear has been performed by esteemed actors since the 17th century when men played all the roles. From the 20th century, a number of women have played male roles in the play, most commonly The Fool, who has been played by Judy Davis, Emma Thompson and Robin Nevin. Lear himself has been played by Marianne Hopper in 1990 and by Catherine Hunter in 1996-7. Marcia Gay Harden plays Lear in a few scenes from the play in the 2012 Canadian film If I Were You. 17th century. As the history of King Lear, Shakespeare wrote the role of Lear for his company's chief tragedian, Richard Burbage, for whom Shakespeare was writing incrementally older characters as their careers progressed. It has been speculated either that the role of the fool was written for the company's clown Robert Arman, or that it was written for performance by one of the company's boys, doubling the role of Cordelia. Only one specific performance of the play during Shakespeare's lifetime is known, before the court of King James I, at Whitehall on 26 December 1606. Its original performances would have been at the Globe, where there were no sets in the modern sense, and characters would have signified their roles visually with props and costumes. Lear's costume, for example, would have changed in the course of the play as his status diminished, commencing in crown and regalia, then as a huntsman, raging bareheaded in the storm scene, and finally crowned with flowers in parody of his original status. All theatres were closed down by the Puritan government on 6 September 1642. Upon the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, two patent companies were established, and the existing theatrical repertoire divided between them and 
From the restoration until the mid-19th century the performance history of King Lear is not the story of Shakespeare's version, but instead of the history of King Lear, a popular adaptation by Nahum Tate. Its most significant deviations from Shakespeare were to omit the fool entirely, to introduce a happy ending in which Lear and Cordelia survive, and to develop a love story between Cordelia and Edgar which ends with their marriage. Like most restoration adapters of Shakespeare, Tate admired Shakespeare's natural genius, but saw fit to augment his work with contemporary standards of art. Tate's struggle to strike a balance between raw nature and refined art is apparent in his description of the tragedy, a heap of jewels, unstrung and unpolisher, yet so dazzling in their disorder, that I soon perceived I had seized a treasure. Other changes included giving Cordelia a confidant named Durante, bringing the play closer to contemporary notions of poetic justice and added titillating materials such as amorous encounters between Edmund and both Regan and Goneril, a scene in which Edgar rescues Cordelia from Edmund's attempted kidnap and rape, and a scene in which Cordelia wears men's pants that would reveal the actress' ankles. The play ends with a celebration of the King's Blessed Restoration, an obvious reference to Charles II. 18th century In the early 18th century, some writers began to express objections to this restoration adaptations of Shakespeare. For example, in The Spectator on 16 April 1711 Joseph Addison wrote, King Lear is an admirable tragedy, as Shakespeare wrote it, but as it is reformed according to the chimerical notion of poetical justice in my humble opinion it hath lost half its beauty. Yet on the stage, Tate's version prevailed. David Garrick was the first actor-manager to begin to cut back on elements of Tate's adaptation in favor of Shakespeare's original. He retained Tate's major changes, including the happy ending, but removed many of Tate's lines, including Edgar's closing speech. He also reduced the prominence of the Edgar Cordelia love story in order to focus more on the relationship between Leo and his daughters. His version had a powerful emotional impact. Leo, driven to madness by his daughters, was the finest tragic distress ever seen on any stage, and, in contrast, the devotion shown to Leo by Cordelia moved the audience to tears. The first professional performances of King Lear in North America are likely to have been those of the Hallam Company which arrived in Virginia in 1752, and who counted the play among their repertoire by the time of their departure for Jamaica in 1774. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.